All right, why don't, why don't we begin? We'll let David in, uh, Josh and, and Boris as he shows up. So welcome everyone, a very good day to you all. Welcome to the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance's special global webinar on Binance, FTX, and the future of crypto exchanges. The collapse of crypto exchange FTX and the liquidity crunch that caused it all has roiled the world of crypto asset markets. Today, our panel of industry experts will examine the fast moving news, discuss the catalyst for these impactful changes and what this might mean for the future of crypto assets. Uh, before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping for today's session. This webinar is being recorded. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Attendees, please, you are encouraged to submit your questions using the Zoom uh, Q&A function. Uh, we will spend some time at the end to address the audience, uh, to address the questions as well. Please keep in mind that this event is offered for general information and educational purposes only and is not intended to constitute investment, legal, tax, or accounting advice, and that any views or opinions expressed during this event are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance or of our participants' firms. So with that, um, we struggled even to keep up with mon changing the name of the event itself, but I want to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Tell us where you're from, what firm you're with, and what you do. Josh, let's start with you. Hi, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Ron, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Josh Clayman. I'm at Link Leaders, which is a global law firm where I'm U.S. head of fintech, head of blockchain and digital assets, and one of our tech, global tech sector co-heads. I'm also um, on the board of the WSBA, and I've chaired its legal working group since 2016, so it's near and dear to my heart. I won't say anything further because I know we want to get right to it. So much. Thanks so much, Josh. Mr. Richard. Uh, uh, thank you, Ron. I again, pleasure to be uh, on this venue. My name is Boris Richard. I'm a senior managing director at JS Held. Um, I lead the crypto advisory at this firm based in Washington, D.C. And uh, again, proud to be a member of uh, Wall Street Blockchain Alliance and be, you know, they are happy to be part of this discussion. Boris, thanks so much. Mr. Brill, proof that is happening in real time, my friend. How are you? I'm great. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Brill. I'm the Deputy General Counsel of Voyager Digital. Uh, as Ron said, uh, my comments today, as well as our co-panelists, will be our personal views. Uh, I've been in this space for many years now and have worked for a number of crypto asset exchanges and had the pleasure of bringing Ether onto a regulated exchange in 2016. So, Thank you all for being here. Really do appreciate it. So one of the opening questions that we had as we did prep has actually changed. And a member of my team said, you should just reframe it as what in the actual bleep is happening? I, I thought we'd start with a bit of, of background. What, what actually, so we've all seen the news this morning, FTX. Uh, file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy uh, in the Delaware courts. I want to level set for the audience. And David, if we could, I'd like to go with you, uh, start with you. And obviously, let's make this conversational. What exactly happened over the course of the past three, four days to FTX? Um, and I think a lot of people in the industry who may know, but may not fully understand, what was the relationship of FTX and Alameda Research, for example? Let's open up, up, up with that. David, you want to kick that off? Sure. You know, encapsulating a ton of data points into a few I think the main things that have occurred in the past few days, it started with a Coindesk article looking at the balance sheet of Alameda and FTX. And based on the snippet of this balance sheet, it became apparent that a lot of the assets on the FTX and Alameda uh, balance sheet were the actual FTT and Serum tokens that um, that belong to and were created by FTX in order to like FTT is to trade on FTX's platform and Serum is another related token. And the follow on from that was that as people saw that, people started deducing that perhaps Alameda and or FTX was insolvent. And so that, did, that led to a cascade of withdrawals off the FTX platform, withdrawals from Alameda and then subsequently, or recalling of loans from Alameda and subsequently spiraled into this situation now where we have this insolvency. There, there are a lot of other data points along the way, sure. but basically it was a classic run on the bank and there weren't enough assets to back up all the assets you know, that were on the platform. So basically um, Alam FTX had transferred customer assets to Alameda to cover debts that Alameda had incurred. So when FTX customers went to withdraw their funds, there was a limit to what FTX had because they had sent, you know, four to six billion dollars over to Alameda. David, I want to I want to 
dig into that a little bit. And Boris uh, and Josh, I'd like to go to you with that. And we've already got questions coming in, so I suspect it's going to be a lively Q&A session at the end. W one of the questions that we often get is, the FTX and Alameda were, up until recently, um, majority owned by Sam Bankman-Fried, who, who you know, respectfully, everyone seemed to think was um, a leader in this space. And it turns out that there seemed to be a bit of commingling there, um, particularly with customer funds, potentially. Boris, what are your perspectives on that? And, and, and ex let us explain for the audience why that's problematic. Uh, well, I don't have like a clear visibility into what actually happened, right? Kind of tacking on what David has said. Uh, there was an interesting video recorded by Glassnode, uh, I think the, yesterday, the day before yesterday, and they tried to establish sort of the close relationship. Boris, it sounds like you're frozen, or I am. Oh, can you see Kim? Can you there you go. Now? You're back. Yeah. Okay. So, so there was an interesting uh, 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 research by Glassnode, which is um. Uh, blockchain analytics uh, company, and they they have shown that there was quite a bit of a massive flow of cryptocurrencies between uh, FTX and Alameda, and uh, they went as far as to claim that Alameda was sort of a, a middleman between FTX and Binance. Um, hmm. And so, additionally, they claim again we have not verified that independently, but they claim that at the end of September of two thousand twenty-two, there was big. Uh, transfer uh, or actually swap. So about 4.2 billion of Bitcoin went from FTX to Alameda and Alameda sent uh, quite a bit of FTT token back to FTX. So so therefore this you know this risk of commingling uh, is serious. We cannot confirm or, or you know deny that at this point. It will all probably become um, clear you know, during the bank bankruptcy proceedings. But if it is true that there was a commingling of funds and certain of the funds were siphoned off from FTX mm -hmm. Alameda, that would be a serious uh, occurrence. And, and again, anecdotally, the SEC is investigating uh, FTX right for potential misuse of funds. And as we understand, that was one of the reasons why Binance might have walked out of the deal to buy FTX in the first place. Boris, and thanks. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. May I just jump in with a few other data points that may become Please. relevant earlier? I mean, later, listen to me. Um, it's been a long couple of days um, that may become relevant later is, you know, for those of us who may have been sitting at home or wherever we were watching Twitter over the weekend, literally as this um, back and forth between CZ at Binance and, um, you know, those at Alameda and, and FTX as it unfolded, I think one of the things just to think back on is Sam Bankman Freed was doing a lot of lobbying in DC, right? It, an extraordinary amount, as we understand it. Um, and this is just based on public information that, that folks have shared. Let me just say, I don't have any secret information and I can't even vouch for necessarily what I'm, what I'm saying. It's just what's been publicly reported. And so as, as has been said in many instances, it's been reported that some of what Sam Bankman Freed was lobbying about um, would have disadvantaged, for example, decentralized finance. Um, also, that he was, in some sense, talking about certain competitors. And so what we saw on Twitter this weekend was um, a statement, a tweet by CZ saying something to the effect of, you know, that certain rumors had been spread about um, competitors and that now finance was going to um, and close its position with respect to FTT because Binance had a large holding of FTT. This um, this announcement was answered by Caroline at at Alameda saying, "Oh, we'll happily buy it for you. Your entire holdings at 22." The CEO of Alameda. Right. Yes. Yep. And so um, I think this is how it all unfolded. What I would say is this becomes relevant later on if and when we talk about the kinds of regulations that he was lobbying for, you know, and the future of that. And also um, thinking about what kinds of donations, really extraordinary amounts of donations had been made to, to different lawmakers and folks. Josh, thank, thanks so much. I want to peel back a little bit <clears throat> on the token conversation. And David, I'd like to go back to you with this. And uh, Josh, we're definitely coming back to the reg regulatory and legislative questions. Um, if we think back to Terra Luna, if we think back to three hours, or think, think back to the earlier parts of this year, when everyone said, this is it, this is the end, and then it got slightly better, and then and then FTX collapsed. 
Uh, one of the words that constantly came up, and we've seen Sam Bankman Fried say this, and we've seen a lot of other colleagues in the industry say this, is collateral, quality collateral. Why are you holding, why is an exchange, for example, uh, holding its own token as collateral? And, and yet that seemed to be exactly in many regards what FTX was doing in some ways. And I know I'm oversimplifying it, but I guess the question, what is the role of collateral here? And David, I'd love to go with you with this because you and I share similar uh, financial markets background versus collateral in TradFi. For example, why was is collateral such a problem in this space? You're on mute, buddy. You know, it's really challenging. And, and I think what I will say is that a lot of the practice in crypto over the last year or two was not to take collateral in many instances for loans. And because crypto is not regulated as a bank, companies had the flexibility to choose whether they took you know, collateral or not as backing for the loans. And I think as we've just seen over the past you know, six to nine months, a more TradFi approach to lending and taking collateral and taking meaningful collateral is gonna be important going forward. But I think it's just the regulation of the lending piece wasn't there. And I think there was just I think there's a little too much hopium that things were going to continue to go up, that um, you know, collateral, everybody was lending to very, you know, thoughtfully to be well capitalized companies. And over time, this practice kind of grew. And I think what we've learned from this is that in the lending piece, and I'll get back to this later because I make this distinction. Yeah. There needs to be more focus on rules around the lending piece because. I don't think that it's not the centralized exchanges are having the issues. It is not that that's the issue. It's the ancillary businesses that they're going in that are causing the issues. And that's something I, we can address a little further. David, thanks so much. And I do see a lot of questions coming in uh, into the audience. Thank you all for being with us. We'll address a lot of your questions as, as many as we can towards the end. Uh, David, Boris, Josh, as we start to talk about this, I wanna kind of rip up the script a little bit here. Um, because you mentioned, uh, we all talked about the investments that have gone into an FTX, for exa example, and Alameda and all these other companies. What is the role of, of investors or VCs in this space? Why wasn't there, where is due diligence in this space? Why wasn't someone saying, what are the quality of, of your reserves? What's being held in reserve? What are you using as collateral? Um, and I want to open up that up for the group. Is there some level of the VC should have done a better job as well, or am I overestimating that? Boris, do you want to you want to try to take that one? Yeah, that's that, that that's that's kind of interesting because uh, if you look if you look at the recent ratings uh, that some some of the analytical firms published, right, on exchange like CryptoCompare.com, so FTX was rated pretty highly, right? Not as not as high, let's say Coinbase, but pretty high, and and they do rating on about eight metrics. Uh, Sequoia, came, Sequoia came out with the with announcement, I believe, yesterday, the day before. They said, "Yeah, we're going to write down 150 million." But at the time we did the due diligence, we did absolutely correctly. I think what happens here is not even so much uh, the quality of the collateral, because uh, the collateral that FTX held over the past several months was about eight to nine hundred million in stable coins, right? So, so it's not. In this particular case, it's not a quality of collateral. I think the, the problem here, as David mentioned, is ancillary businesses. We don't know the full picture of who deals with and how the conflicts of interest may come into the picture and, and how the customer funds may be sent out or repledged uh, or lent out to uh, to related entities. And I think that's that's sort of the issue here, not necessarily the quality of the collateral by itself. Boris, go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just, I, I think it's, it can be very hard, right? Um, obviously, throughout different industries, different verticals, different entire uh, things having nothing to do with digital assets or crypto, there are always um, charismatic personalities um, that come up from time to time and people trust them, right? I think we got so used to hearing that Sam Bankman Freed and FTX would be the lender of last resort, a la JP Morgan in the years of old that it's really surprising. You know, I think it's a big surprise to everyone. So perhaps people, um, had they not, all I'm saying is it can be very challenging um, in these sorts of situations. And not that I, um, not that all the facts have come out, 
Uh, and so all of these are, are allegations at this point, I believe. But if you look at, for example, Bernie Madoff in a different context, who knew about that? Josh, good point. And I, I think, you know, many of us know we have a colleague that says um, the entirety of the industry is often driven by um, generally men and, and oversized egos. Um, and I, I want to ask what might be a provocative question in this context, because immediately after the news broke that FTX might be insolvent, there are going to be issues. There was this Twitter storm between, and you mentioned CZ, for the audience, Josh, the, the, the chief executive of Binance, um, and Sam Bankman Fried and FTT. And then relatively quickly, there was this non binding letter of intent to help buy, take over some portion of FTX, which within 24 hours was withdrawn. How much of that was true? How much of that was marketing? And we've heard some pretty provocative commentary about how Binance approached this. Um, I, does anyone have perspectives on what was that really all about? Was it meant to get rid of FTX and take a player off the table or? Was it legitimate? And we've seen others now being put forward, cracking some others. David, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I want to go back to one the question you asked first, and, then, and I'll go back to this one. You know, it is very traditional in technology for companies, VCs and PEs, invest in companies that are losing money because they want to invest in a company that's getting scale and growing. So I, I think we are kind of looking, you know, in retrospect, at choices that people made at the time that seemed very, very logical and reasonable. And perhaps the diligence that was done may be a little less or a little more. You know, neither of the three of us were in the rooms for these investments. But, you know, investing in companies that lose money or, you know, to grow share and lose money is not something unusual. I'm sure investors in Amazon did that at one time and some of the other big tech companies. So just a data point. To go back to your other point, you know, Twitter Twitter is great in that it's this, you know, place where everybody can speak their voice and share their views. And, you know, look, it seemed like that conversation between CZ and SPF got personal. And, uh, you know, I think, like Josh said, I think some of the behind the scenes lobbying that Sam was doing that allegedly was to Binance's, you know, detriment, you know, came to light. And, uh, you know, Binance held a lot of these FTT tokens. And I think there was one particular comment Sam made that was inflammatory that may have just pushed the dial to the point where, you know, CZ came out and said that we're going to sell the FTT. And I would, I would say also, you know, in statements on Twitter, to the extent that I've tried to stay up <laughs> watching them, um, it appears that CZ, when addressing folks at Binance, had said he wasn't aware of the extent of this, that, that it, that he did not anticipate that this would happen. I'm obviously using my own words and and not his. But um, obviously, we don't know how much how much of that is necessarily accurate. I'll just say, mm -hmm. but that's at least what's been what's been said. I do think that even with the idea of a letter of intent, I mean, there would have been significant, as I understand it, competition and antitrust concerns. Also, questions about whether you know um, certain non-U.S. entities would potentially you know, own assets in the US or, or purchase entities um, in the US. And also I think we saw some back and forth about whether uh, frankly FTX US would be included in the deal. And at least until the, um, the filing this morning um, in bankruptcy court, I think it, the idea was that FTX US was in a healthier place. Josh, David, thanks. You both raised an interesting point. Uh, it kind of focuses on centralization and consolidation, potentially antitrust concerns down the road. Boris, as part of the email prep we've all done, you raised this concern as well. Can you yeah, speak yeah. to that a little bit? I mean, there's still the rumor mill of, well, after bankruptcy, someone will pick up their assets. We don't know. What will that look like? Could you speak to that a little bit? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, if, if you look at the statistics, right, uh, prior prior to the demise of FTX, uh, four exchanges controlled 87% of derivatives business trading volume, right, total. So the buy, buy, FTX, was, FTX was one of them, right? Um, and then in spot, about six, six firms, they control 81%. So uh, again, according to the same statistic, about 54, 55% of both derivative and spot trading volume globally was controlled by Binance, right? Yeah. So we do know that the, the heaven flows of funds as part, as part of the FTA, FTX demise, there was flow of funds from 
uh, FTX wallets uh, through Blockfolio and others to either Binance wallets or to the Binance Smart Chain. So we can all envision that the you know the size and, and the importance of Binance will increase and you know will be more than 55% that it has been before that this collapse. Does it create issues about you know over you know excessive concentration of trading power? I would say so. What it what it means for liquidity? Uh, again, if you have fewer you know significant providers of liquidity, then the aggregators might be you know hostage or subject to particular pricing that happens on a particular asset of, uh, on Binance, for example. So from my perspective as an economist, that's definitely a concern. Well, David, do you see the same thing? What are your what are your kind of consolidation concerns? And I know you and I've had this conversation several times in the past. Well, look, I I'm a big proponent of the free markets, and I think that you know we also have to consider that there is trading available on decentralized exchanges, and you know people are not sort of hostage to only a few centralized exchanges. I mean, it's hard to say. Like in a restructuring, you know, there might have been more flexibility for Binance to do something because of the nature of the losses that may have occurred. But I think ultimately, I think they were being, I think Binance was being prudent, competitor was in distress, and why not take a look and see if there was an opportunity uh, business-wise to get involved. I mean, and look, we found the answer out quickly that they determined that it wasn't a prudent opportunity for them and they stepped away. So, uh, but I do think when you look at transactions, you really need to include decentralized exchanges as places where people can buy and trade digital assets and think about that when you think about the overall marketplace. David, that's a really good point. And, and we've all raised this in our email correspondence. Is this a net positive long-term for DeFi? What does, and I know there are probably some regulators out there who are gonna be pulling their hair as we say it. Um, but what's that, what's your collective perspective on DeFi and whether or not it's a net positive for them going forward for DeFi ecosystem broadly? I mean, well. I'll let you go first, Boris. I know you're, <laughs> you and I are both very passionate about DeFi, but uh... Uh, I, I think it's an, I think it's an, an, a positive, right? Because in the end, it kind of comes to what comes to light again. This this uh, phase, your private key, your money, right? Yeah. If if so, w w we had the situation with Celsius. We have now the situation, probably at a much larger scale, with FTX, uh, and uh, not very many centralized exchanges uh, engage something that's called the Merkle tree proof of their reserves. I mean, some of them started doing it, include Binance and Gate.io. FTX was not one of them. Uh, but from a from a DeFi perspective, you know, if you self custody your funds, you know, this is the first thing that comes to mind, given all the debacle that has happened since May of this year. So and I would not be surprised if Uniswap, uh, Unif let's say Uniswap uh, trading volumes, which are now rival Coinbase volumes, right, about one and a half billion per day, that will continue to grow because people would know we don't need any more you know, uh, custodied wallets, which we don't know what's going to happen to because we don't know all the relationships and, and uh, entanglement between different business entities. We don't know how it would affect my particular deposit or that particular exchange. So from that perspective, definitely uh, self-custody uh, DeFi uh, route becomes more uh, appealing to, me, to many of the traders and many investors, especially as the DeFi gets under the compliance umbrella and develops solutions to be compliant and you know cognizant of the regulations globally. Boris, for the audience, uh, just and omitting the technicals of it, Merkle Tree proof of reserves, basically open capability to determine the actual reserves of any given platform, correct? Well, uh, exactly. So basically, in the Merkle Tree proof, what happens? The exchange generates you know hashed customer IDs as well as with their balances, to token by token. A an auditor creates uh, a Merkle tree with, with a root hash, um, which basically contains uh, in a stacked version, the entire information about the liabilities of an exchange, right? The customer deposit their liability. So right. the liability re report is being created. And then uh, uh, that's step number one. Step number two, they randomly select any, any number of the uh, customer IDs to verify that the the ledger of the liabilities is complete. And then as the last step, they look at all the wallets that an exchange claims to be theirs and they basically see how much funds they have. Right. And they compare the amount of assets in those addresses versus the verified ledger liability. That's what basically, so the liability side is handled through the Merkle tree. 
mm -hmm. uh, you know, a root, root generation. And most recently, Gate.io actually made it public and published on the GitHub. So now every customer, at least for, for Gate.io, they may go and make sure that their particular deposit account is captured in that Merkle tree. Right. And, and the centralized exchanges that we've come to know, FTX included, weren't doing anything close to that because it was, it was much more opaque um, no open sense of proof of reserves or anything like that. Well, I think some of them started doing it. I mean, Gate.io has been doing it for some sure. time, uh, and then the Kraken as well. Yeah. So, so I, I don't know. I don't have the entire list of exchanges, but I think that's a growing trend. And I think Binance, after what happened, they said that they will start doing the same verification yep. of their liability side versus the asset side going forward, using the same or similar type of technology. Boris, thanks. Josh, I, I just wanted to give you a moment as well. Sure. Although I know. Uh, David also has something I believe he wants to say about this topic. But what I would say is, I think as Boris is kind of saying, um, and as um, you know, Gary Gensler went on CNBC yesterday and and alluded to, you know, a lot of this is disclosure. You know, a lot of this is information asymmetry, and that is something where, as as has been noted, you know, there is potential in DeFi, right? Because transparency is is one of the goals. I do think obviously there's a lot of things in DeFi that you know are a work in progress um in general just as as we think about it coming under certain regulatory umbrellas whether you know with respect to KYC like know your customer any money laundering types of of checks and the like um which are not generally standard across the DeFi market yet um but I do think transparency and disclosure I mean that that's at the root of of a lot of these these things that we've seen over the past few months with a variety of centralized entities. Josh, thanks. David, go ahead. And I know it, just for the rest of the audience, we please keep your questions coming. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of them on regulation, particularly once we said the phrase defra, DeFi, uh, which we'll address towards the end as well. So please do keep those coming. David, you're, please weigh in there. Yeah, I, I would just say that you know, loans, when you look at some of the loans that were made on, on DeFi platforms, they were very visible and they were very transparent. So like, for instance, when Celsius filed for bankruptcy, it's been shown that they paid off several of their DeFi loans. And you could see the amounts they paid off and the amount of collateral that was being held on the platform. And I just think that kind of um, disclosure and transparency is really important in this space. You know, the other thing I'll say is, you know, again, when we look at what's happened here, you know, moving customer assets into another entity and using them for another purpose, like that's something that could happen not just in crypto, it could happen in other industries and it's happened in other industries. So, you know, misappropriating funds, it's not a crypto issue. It's really a broader business issue. It's just unfortunate that in, in our ecosystem right now, we've had that happen, you know, with um, FTX and potentially Celsius. So. I just let's not lose the in the micro focus. Let's not lose the macro focus that this does happen in business. And it just unfortunately right now it's happening in our space. David, and fair as, point. Go ahead, as greatly seems to be noted in the comments, oh, sometimes and there, you know, there are allegations of fraud as well. And so fraud isn't going to be fixed by disclosure, but I, I do think um disclosure is nonetheless important. But it's a it's a good point that. To the extent that this relates to fraud, that's a whole nother set of kettle of fish. I, I, I would also say it's, it's also the type of uh, sort of business mentality that needs to be somehow addressed here, right? Because if you take customer deposits, like, for example, you know, Celsius or, or uh, centralized crypto lenders, and you promise certain rate of return, and then you're free to do whatever, whatever you want to do with those deposits, and you make investments based on those deposits, so that be, that becomes an issue because that can lead to excessive, you know, uh, excessive amounts of risk. So it's it's I wouldn't say necessarily it's a misappropriation in in all the situations, but it is a type of product that's being offered by some of the you know crypto entities. And the question whether that particular product, if it's being offered, whether it should be regulated. And some of the state legislature they took sort of a. Um, uh, um, an expected approach saying that some of the interest rate products that are being offered by the crypto lenders is security. Why? Because you take people's money and you invest as you see fit to generate the yield in excess of what you're being paid, paying on your liabilities. So it's a business model that drives sometimes excess leverage and excess risk taking that, that has grappled this industry over the past, I'd say, 12 to 18 months. 
I feel David wanting to follow up with that. Go ahead, David. <laughs> well, I, I agree. You know, the majority of bars, I, I agree with what he said. I, I don't think it's clear that some of the rewards products or other products are securities. I think there's a lot of law that would push back against that notion. But I think generally speaking, like, yes, like I said before, the actual centralized exchanges themselves, like those are not, it's not an issue with the trading on the exchanges. It's going into these other product areas that have just become trickier and have exposed some companies to additional risk. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. I want to um, let's dig in a little bit, and we've got we're getting a lot of questions that are kind of pointing this way. And Josh, I'd like to come to you. Let's peel back the layers of the impact of FTX bankruptcy filing this morning. Uh, you and I had an interesting conversation just before the call um, on creditors, how they are impacted. What are the what are the potential ramifications um, of the Chapter Eleven filing, and what should creditors be aware of, or what are the questions? in your mind, and we'll open this up for the group as well, that they should be asking. What are those questions they should ask? Josh, go ahead. Sure. So with the caveat that I am not a bankruptcy lawyer, although I was a finance lawyer for, for many years. Um, so, you know, check your check with your local <laughs> bankruptcy and insolvency lawyer. Um, nonetheless, you know, within now that there has been this Chapter 11 filing in um, in Delaware this morning, you know, there is a 90 day preference period um, that that looks back over the past 90 days. And so creditors paid within the past 90 days before this filing under certain circumstances may need to return payments as a preference. Um, I think this is um, this is relevant, not just for, uh, for payments that may have been made. Well, I guess, let me step back for a second. To the extent that the customers may be um, unsecured creditors of FTX, I think we also need to think about and ask the questions about, did those people who were able, people, by people, I mean people, entities, et cetera, who were able to take their funds, whether those may need to be returned in certain instances. I think someone, I think, I believe it was Tom Bragelman on, um, on LinkedIn noted this morning that that, in his view was, I, I don't have firsthand knowledge of this, but that that happened actually with the Madoff case that people actually had to return them out. So I think looking into that, that's an important point. I think also um, thinking about people need, well, folks need to look at any agreements that they have with FTX or any of these associated entities of which there are over 130. Um, in some cases, or, or in many cases, if you were say to write a lease or a, a lending agreement or something like that, different types of agreements, you would hopefully, put in something that there was, if there were a bankruptcy or insolvency um, of the other party, that that would automatically trigger, for example, acceleration or termination or something like that. Because in certain instances, you may not after the filing be able to file a notice of termination or a notice of acceleration because of the automatic stay in bankruptcy. So I think that's something that I believe should be of concern to a lot of people because frequently in um, in our space, a lot of these agreements are bespoke and they terms like this may not be really closely looked at or sometimes understood. Now, again, um, it's gonna depend upon applicable law and I am not a, a bankruptcy lawyer, but I think that these are really important things to think about. Also, um, just as we go forward, you know, we've seen in the um, in the Celsius bankruptcy case, and I think this is something that Caitlin Long highlighted today on LinkedIn, is the possibility that these customers who are unsecured creditors may all be doxxed, right? And so I think that's that's another piece that we need to consider. Also, as this moves forward, really understanding whether um, whether the debtor, um, so the you know the filer, whether they would assume or reject certain certain customers or certain contracts. Um, basically this, this period right now, this automatic stay sort of gives a breathing period to the debtor, right? The, uh, the chapter 11 is re reorganization. And so one of the things is that in many instances, I, I won't say in all instances, because I'm sure there's nuance uh, there and, and significant law of which I'm unaware, and this is not legal advice, but often the the non-debtor, um, the, the non-filer needs to continue performing under its agreements. So I think that this is going to be um, 
an important an important piece. And as we look at the various assets held, and then I'll be quiet. I promise, no, okay. Ron. I see you Go trying to break in. Um, as we look at the various uh, assets held or entitlements that um, that FTX and its affiliates have, thinking about what what tokens it may hold and what tokens it may be entitled to in the future, just in the event of of asset sales or things like that, what that may mean to the market. Because we already know if you, with certain tokens, if they're depending on how liquid the market is, if you sell a significant portion into the market, it's going to move the market. Josh, thanks. And before I give David and Boris an opportunity to chime in on that point, I, I know we talked about leaving questions to the end. One just jumped at us from a, a dear friend of all of ours. Will the campaign donations be covered as preferential treatments? Interesting question. Something to think about. Um, one more quick question, a quick point for everyone on the call. Uh, we will, we're getting a lot of requests to make the recording available. We will do that several days after this event as well. But uh, Boris, David, to the bankruptcy question. And David, I, I certainly want to be uh, careful here. I know uh, you've been you're down this road, and there's a lot you can't say. But to the extent you can weigh in on some of this, I think it's an important perspective. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, and I think broadly speaking, like if we look at the pool of creditors and think about it a little broad, more broadly, not just customers, but also sort of people who are investors in in FTX or Alameda. Like, I think some of the things we need to really think about is like how are your digital and your digital assets or investments like be classified in an insolvency proceeding. I think that's a really important thing to think about. And also, you know, valuation. Like, how will they be valued? Because we know there's going to be some assets that will be recoverable in this, in this bankruptcy. So I think really thinking about these things. And, you know, one of the other things is what happens if you're a counterparty and you have collateral? Like, what should you do about that? I mean, obviously, like Josh said, we're not here to give legal advice, but we're sort of issue spotting some of the bigger issues um, you know, for people. And then to some extent, like, you know, what happens if you do withdraw your assets now and you have the ability to do that? Um, you know, do you consider like keeping them, you know, somewhere separately, knowing that they could potentially be clawed back? So I think there are a lot of dimensions to this. And, you know, another thing is people will want to know if they have legal recourse against individuals or the entity. So I think there's a lot of dimensions to this where uh, you know, people really need to think about it. And like Josh said, look at your agreements mm. and, and uh, you know, what your responsibilities are. But I think the nature, the dimension of this being, you know, having gone on overseas and here in the U.S., you know, there'll be a lot of sort of issues that need to play out. And as we get more clarity, will it be, you know, U.S. law dominating this, you know, restructuring or could it be Bahamian law where, uh, you know, they're registered. So I think there are a lot of questions to come, but I think being thoughtful in the moment about where you stand is important. David, thanks. Boris, anything you want to add to the to the bankruptcy commentary before we move on? Um, you know, I, again, I'm not a, I, I'm not a bankruptcy, uh, uh, per, you know, uh, person per se, but I think uh, what will be interesting during these proceedings, I, I would bring two things. Number one, sort of the interconnectedness and the, you know, uh, interconnectedness between different entities uh, because one, bank one bankruptcy leads to um, you know, complications with, with, the, with the proceedings for other entities, right? We never knew that Terra Luna back in 2000 May, uh, 2022 can create all these snowballs effect that we're feeling right now and they you know, penetrate the entire fabric of the crypto community. Um, so, and, and we know that BlockFi, they, the limited withdrawals and they pause the withdrawals, right? Why? Because they received a lifeline from FTX at some point. So again, David probably knows much more than I do about, you know, what was going to happen to Voyager situation. Um, and that's, so contagion, that's one thing or interconnectedness. And the second one, I think the valuation issues will, will be key. Right, because again, if you look at the balance sheet of Al Alameda, again, if you, if uh, in, in, at least based on what we've seen on November second, um, the question will become how do you uh, value different assets, including the one that are locked. So you know, it, you know, with that from that perspective, I mean, I've seen it happening in some of the damages cases where certain tokens are locked and you have to value them, and it's hard to estimate what the discount should be. So I think these similar type of valuation issues will come up definitely uh, during this bankruptcy. 
Boris, thanks. I want to pivot a little bit. Um, I want to go to regulatory and legislative and, and the usual usual cast of characters out of Washington, D.C., and certainly overseas as well, as well have weighed in. Uh, the SEC chair, and I'm so totally paraphrasing here, said something along the lines of patience is wearing thin. Um, and several politicians have kind of raised their fist around see crypto is all smoke and mirrors. The, the one thing that did come out of uh, the SEC chair as well, and this is not meant to particularly bash him at all, is come in and register. And a colleague of mine deep in this space has said, that is not helpful. What does that mean? I guess the question overall becomes, what will we see next from regulators to the extent we can discuss it in the wake of FTX? And this is going to play out over several weeks, if not more, certainly. Um, what does that look like? Any thoughts on the regulatory landscape? Boris, let's stay with you. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, to be honest, it's hard to, from my perspective, it's hard to know what will be the next step with the regulators, right? Because uh, all of the changes are currently, or many of them are being investigated, at least based on what we see in the press. <clears throat> and that, you know, gamut, you know, runs from the listing policies to the risk controls that they have. Um, given the lack of regulatory clarity and what exactly, what exactly does it mean to have consumer or customer protection, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of noise, a lot of talk. Um, there is a legislative bill in a, in a Congress that tries to address that. But again, specifically from the regulators, uh, I'm not even sure what the next steps will be. I would imagine there will be requirements for much more transparency, transparency of the liabilities and assets. And I'm hopeful that there will also be some kind of regulations that will minimize or prevent uh, the danger of conflicts of interest uh, between, let's say, an alternative trading platform uh, and some related entity that we may not be aware of. So, but in terms of the specific steps that will be taken, I mean, it's really hard to say. At this, uh, at this point, but transparency and some rules or some at least uh, guidances as to how to, you know, make sure that the assets exceeding the liabilities for an exchange, as well as the issues of the quality of the collateral. Again, the USDC, right, in the circle has been very vocal about, oh, we have 100% in, in fiat, we are the best regulated stable coin, and, and right, rightfully so, because of the quality collateral. So they, yeah. Boris, you froze again. We're going to step away for a moment. Josh, I just want to go to you, and I want to be a bit circumspect about this when I ask you about regulators, but you do spend quite a bit of time talking to regulators on behalf of clients, and I know there's there's limits to what you can talk about, but will the tone and tempo change? What's it been like, and where do you see it going? So in terms of whether the, the tone and tempo will change, I mean, certainly it's not helpful to our industry that Sam Bankman-Fried in many ways was the face of crypto. I mean, if you walked through train stations or airports, I, you know, in many instances, you saw stadiums. his face, yeah. right? Um, and I think he was quite successful in in speaking with regulators and speaking with legislators. I mean, he was very active in trying to have FTX US derivatives um, to, to have the CFTC allow FTX to directly clear customers' derivatives transactions. I think things like that, where there may have been headway, um, the fact that he was associated with it could be a move back. Also, um, you know, we've seen certain uh, certain folks in Congress have tweets and other sorts of um, reactions kind of looking to regulators saying, you know, what were you doing? Um, I think this may cause regulators to say, OK, we're even more on enforcement now because the ones one of the ones that we thought that we could trust allegedly, let me just say all of this is allegations at this point. Um, look, it wasn't what we thought. And so I, I do think you know, in addition to being exchange, obviously, as, as we've discussed here, F FTX also was an issuer of a token. So I think that's, you know, there are there are many layers here, um, as as David and others have noted, um, there are many dimensions. So I, I do think just stepping back for a second to, to legislators, as I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, one of the things that that Sam Bankman Fried had really been lobbying for. And I think Ron Hammond on Twitter really went into this really well yesterday um, is the DCCPA, the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act. And so I do think, you know, questions about the viability of, of bills like that where he was very active, you know, is it somehow tainted? Right. And I think also there have been questions again about whether those to whom he he gave significant donations, whether they need to recuse themselves um, in certain 
circumstances. But I would say, as to your other question, um, as I think I've said for a long time, I think productive conversations can be had with regulators um, at certain times and with certain clients, right? Not not in every certain. I would say people should, it's a facts and circumstances assessment of whether you should go talk to the regulator. Let me say that. Um, and, but I, I do think that I foresee more, more enforcement. And Josh, just to interject real quickly, and David, I want to give you the floor. I, I certainly, we're addressing this in a very US-centric way. We have colleagues internationally who have dialed in. And just to be clear, if you look at the news, I believe, someone correct me if I'm wrong, Cyprus revoked FTX's um, brokerage license or ability to do business in Europe. I think Bahamas has put them in receivership. So I mean, there, this, there's a clear international regulatory uh, schema to all of this. David, weigh in on a little bit of that. And I do want to pivot a little bit more on the legislative stuff, but go ahead. You're on mute, buddy. I agree with, uh, you know, Boris and Josh, but I, what I will say is, like, I think it's really important to look at the global aspect and that we need to come up with regulation that's common sense, that's prudent, that will allow this industry to grow, because if we don't, it will just go offshore. So my view is that I think looking at the ancillary businesses and how to regulate those could be a place where we could coalesce around the risks because I still believe that the centralized exchanges doing their core trading and brokering functions, those functions aren't the issue. It's really these other business lines that are becoming problematic. And I think that might be a great area to focus on first and then look at some of the other, looking at some of the other trading and brokering and just you know, create a little more infrastructure around that. That's David, what I that, think is the most prudent way to go about it. David, thanks. You, you So you, you said something that's interesting and it reminded me, uh, and several of us have read online, several colleagues in the space have, have called this a legislative failure on the part of the United States and that we'd be remiss in not looking at that angle. Meaning, had there been some proper guidance and proper regulation, not so much of the world of crypto would have been driven overseas, is that fair? Is it fair to call what's happening to FTX in part a legislative failure on the part of the United States? Look, I don't think so. I think the, look, let's recall that besides the FTX US entity, the majority of FTX and Alameda is all offshore. Right. So, you know, it's not clear what reach, if you're not selling the US customers or not taking US investors, like there's not a real nexus to reach out. Right now, I think the main regulatory reach out would be if you're not doing OFAC and, and sort of treasury type functions. But, you know, what we do in the U.S. can't be just foisted onto entities that deal overseas that don't see U.S. customers. So I think we have to be mindful of that. I think this is a complicated issue. And I think we need as a group to get people in a room who can see the landscape of what things are now and how things work now and come up with a regime that reflects that. And one other thing I'll just say is that, look, you know, we're very passionate about crypto, but at its, at its largest, it was a $3 billion asset class, or maybe more if you include derivatives. Trillion. Three trillion, correct. And maybe more if you include derivatives. Yeah. But, you know, the broader stock market is still, you know, many multiples of that. So realistically, I think we could use some really insightful, thoughtful process in looking at this really on a, on a multi-dimensional level. But we also have to be realistic on like of the concerns of the different regulators. Where did this sit? Yeah. And we can't lose sight of that because we're on our own crypto echo chamber a little bit. So, David, thanks. I want to ask one last question. Um, and Boris, I'd like to start with you and then we'll go to Q&A. We've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, and that question really is almost meant to be predictive, so I don't want to hold anyone to this, but where does the contagion end in the context of FTX? And the reason I ask that is that there's this chart floating around the interwebs of dozens and dozens and dozens of corporate entities with various interact interconnectivities with FTX and, and every one of its, its parts. Um, anyone care to start predicting where this ends? <laughs> I realize that's probably a, a difficult question. I, I guess maybe I'll make it, I'll try to make it simpler for my own mind. How long will it be before it, it ends if anyone doesn't want to wait, if, if someone wants to weigh in there? How long will we be dealing with this rapid changing news cycle? 
Don't say forever, David, no. please. No. Oh. I, I'll, you go first, Josh. I have a view, but go, go ahead. So I still don't have an answer on how long, but I will say about some of the information um, floating around on Twitter, um, including about payments allegedly yep. made by, um, by FTX or its affiliates in the recent past, um, I've been informed by certain folks that that's, those aren't correct in many instances, or at least in some instances where there are particularly large numbers on the chart that I saw, and they're not accurate from the view of the other party. So I think that's something just to be aware of. I definitely think there are questions that we won't know yet. Um, I'm sure some people know, but also to the extent, for example, that pre, um, pre-filing payments were made to bail out others whether those need to be clawed back or or not, or what happens with those sorts of agreements. Um, I think that that remains to be seen. I did want to say one thing, though, before I, I turn it over, I guess, to David, um, is just this, just stepping back for a second. A lot of this, again, is potentially driven by fraud by a person or people. And I think one of the things we should just bear in mind, although, of course, as I understand from my bankruptcy and insolvency colleagues, courts will ultimately determine the status of, of various um, of various things, various assets. But I, I think there are different ways to hold customer assets, right? There are some that might be governed by trust law. Others, in some cases, um, you may have things within an omnibus wallet, but where the terms and, and conditions say we are opting into Article 8 of the Uniform Commercial Code, and we are holding these as a securities intermediary, we're, we're calling them securities for purposes of the UCC, not necessarily for federal securities laws. Um, but these sorts of things, we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that every customer of every exchange um, is an unsecured creditor, right? There are different terms and conditions. And frankly, I haven't read the terms and conditions of FTX, so I don't know. But we do know in Celsius, for example, there was language that said, um, you know, we can take title to the to the assets and we can hypothecate them that customers may be um, unsecured creditors, but that's not the case across the board. And so, um, you know, certainly we shouldn't automatically look at other U.S. trading platforms, aka exchanges, and say, okay, they should also fall within the same um, circumstance. Josh, thanks. David, Boris, give you 20 seconds because we do have a lot of questions to hit if you want to follow up on Josh's comments. I do. Let's just remember that the actual protocols themselves, the different tokens and the different to token protocols still work the same way they did two days ago, regardless of whether FTX and Alameda you know, were insolvent or not. So let's just remember the bigger picture. This is an intermediary issue. It's not a protocol issue. So I think personally that this will resolve itself in the next couple of weeks or months. And again, the protocols are fine. There may be a couple of protocols that had treasuries on FTX or an affected platform, and that's an issue. But it's really this is really an intermediary issue. And so if you keep that in mind, like things will flow within the system. And, and I'm confident in the next couple of months this will get sorted. David, thanks. Boris, you want to add anything to that? Or should we go to QA? Yeah, I, I, I would add uh, again, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't have any crystal ball into the timeline, and we have to separate between sort of legal bankruptcy related proceedings versus sort of the economic impacts on the industry. Um, I would say that uh, overall, I agree with David that and, and, and Josh, it's sort of a bump in the road, right? And I think the good that comes out of yes, the VCs will have to step back. The trading counterparties like Genesis and, and others who uh, who were dealing and Amber Data who were dealing with exchanges, they will have to re revisit their risk taking appetites. Some of the protocols may have slowed down in their development, like people talk about Solana being taken, you know, taking some temporary hit. Albeit Solana is already taking uh, measures to contain the damage, right, by unstaking less than what they expected mm. to 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 reduce the downward pressure on the uh, uh, SOL token. I think longer term. Is it two months, three months, four months? I don't know, but I think the positive side of it is that people will revisit their risk-taking procedures. They will revisit their hedging procedures. They will learn how to estimate the quality of the collateral and the cross correlations between the collateral. And they will be very cognizant of any liquidity discounts that they have to put on when they take mm -hmm. something in crypto space as a collateral behind a loan. So I think from a risk-taking and prudence perspective, I think 
yes, uh, you know, people suffer and that's generally a setback for the industry, but I think there are, you know, positive repercussions that will come out of it. Boris, thanks very much. I want to get to some questions. We're not going to get to them all. I appreciate the audience's time. Um, Joey posted the current description of exactly what happened, which seems to be morphing repeatedly. We'll share that with colleagues uh, after the event. Question number one is interesting. FTX Ventures, FTX Alameda has collectively invested in 250 startups in Web3 and crypto, many of which, many with them as lead investors. What is the immediate and long-term impact for these startups in your opinions? Anyone want to weigh in on that? You know, I would say the immediate impact is whether these startups had their treasuries on FTX or Alameda or not, and what is their ability to access their treasuries if they did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just because an entity is a lead investor doesn't mean, you know, you can be a lead investor, but you're not actively involved with the protocol. You just provided, you know, capital to the protocol. So uh, I don't think that will hamper, in most cases, any development or activities on the protocol. It's just a matter of, in the immediate term, will these protocols have access to their treasuries? Go ahead, Josh. So, so I agree with David. I do think, though, that you know FTX and other entities were doing a huge amount of marketing, right? And a massive amount of marketing for many of, of the projects that they invested in, at least as I understand it. Um, and also, there's the question of market making for certain of the relevant tokens. So I do think, depending on on the go forward activities of of FTX and Alameda and the various entities, that there there could be impacts. Um, I also do think that it's it's likely that you know some of the marketing and other activities that that were going on um, may be under greater scrutiny um, by regulators and others. So I, those are some of the thoughts that I. Josh, thanks. I, and again, there was a lot of questions here. We'll have to cherry pick through them. We can answer them after the event as well. Interesting question. We, we throw out the regulator acronyms all the time. And one of the one of the attendees asked, how does the SEC have jurisdiction here, if at all? Do they, Josh? So it's a question I've asked myself <laughs> um, and I've been I've been thinking through. I mean, I do have to wonder, you know, I don't know enough about the issuance of, for example, the FTT token. Right or certain other activities, um, or we've definitely heard Gary Gensler saying that in his view, a lot of trading platforms are allowing the trading of of tokens that he believes are securities. So I think there are potential um, ways in in that regard. Also, to the extent, for example, if FTT token were a security, you know whether there was market manipulation in any of those um, tweeting circumstances. So I don't know the answer. Um, and again, I, I'm trying to figure it out too. I think a lot of people are, Josh. We've got uh, time for, yeah. go ahead, I Boris, I'm sorry. I, yeah, quickly, I think the SEC steps in if there is an evidence or at least a suspicion that a US investor might've been hurt, right? <clears throat> so even if it's an offshore entity, and we've seen that in the Bitfinex case, for example, that was not an SEC case, but nevertheless, uh, if, if something is being traded into the hands of a US customer, and there is, a, or even, even if, um, they may not be, you know, direct evidence, but if there were no bifurcation and no geofencing at some point in time, that opens up the door that, oh, yes, there may be some U.S. folks who purchased some token, that will be enough for the SEC to step in, even aside from the question of Section 5, whether something is a security or not. Last question. We've got to wrap it up. I, I, we could go on for another hour, I think. But this one, this one stuck out for me. Couldn't any of the debtors assert a proper, proprietary claim rather than a contractual claim against FTX? Does that need to be property claim, I guess? Yeah, I'm not sure what they're getting at. I, I don't know if they phrase the question as, as they meant to, but uh, look, I, I think there's going to be, like I talked about before, you know, what the claims are, how they're valued, what the priority of the claims are. Um, you know, are some claims going to be clawed back? Clawed back um, you know, the issue of doxing that Josh raised, mm. these are all things that we're going to see, you know, as this filing progresses. And, you know, we'll see a lot of information and analysis on, on how these things will be treated. We're, we're out of time. I kind of feel like we'll have a post-mortem follow-up webinar on FTX. Josh, David, Boris, such a privilege. Really appreciate your thought leadership. For all of the attendees who joined us, thank you so much. We'll have the recording available in the coming days. We'll leave it there. It's a fast moving space. Stay tuned. Um, we'll try to send some information to attendees as well. But Josh, David, Boris, thank you again. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Take thank care, you. everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye. And great questions. Yes.